This is a 73-year-old man with dyspnea and recurrent pleural effusions. He had significant <coughs> comorbidities, including stage three chronic kidney disease. He had moderate lung disease, and he had had extensive workup elsewhere prior to coming to us to optimize his therapy for COPD and restrictive lung disease, restrictive felt to be due to these pleural effusions. He also had pulmonary hypertension, and the pulmonary hypertension had been worked up. Uh, he didn't have any pulmonary thromboembolic disease, and uh, his lung disease had been optimized. He had had a recent coronary angiogram that showed an occluded obtuse marginal, but no other significant disease. On physical examination, he had a grade two to three over six late peaking systolic ejection type murmur at the base and a whole systolic murmur at the apex. He had decreased breath sounds at the bases, as you'd expect from this chest x-ray showing these pleural effusions, and he had brawny pedal edema. Here's his transthoracic echocardiogram. In the parasternal long axis view, you can see that the left ventricle systolic function looks good. There's heavy calcification of the aortic valve with significant reduction in mobility. And looking at the aortic valve in short axis view, it really looks pretty tightly stenosed. The patient was normotensive, left atrium is enlarged, left ventricle was also slightly enlarged, and you can see mitral annulus calcification. That mitral annulus and mitral valve disease is significant, resulting in a lot of mitral regurgitation. His regurgitant volume calculated by PISA method was 50 milliliters. And looking at the short axis view, you can see this mitral annulus calcification is at least moderate. This results in a diastolic gradient across the mitral valve of nine millimeters mercury at a heart rate of 104. His ejection fraction was 66%. You can see significant biatrial enlargement Here we're looking at that mitral regurgitation, again, in case you weren't convinced that it was quite a lot. And here is his tricuspid regurgitation velocity, peak velocity at 3.6 meters per second. His inferior vena cava was dilated and plethoric, um, didn't collapse with inspiration. So assuming a right atrial pressure, 20 millimeters mercury, his right ventricular systolic pressure was 72 millimeters mercury. Here's the assessment of his aortic stenosis. The left ventricular outflow tract diameter was 2.4 centimeters. The left ventricular outflow tract time velocity integral, shown here is kind of low at just 15 centimeters. The peak velocity across his aortic valve, here from an apical window, was 3.7 meters per second. And the mean systolic gradient was 35 millimeters mercury. So of course we calculate his aortic valve area using principles of flow continuity, where the flow across the aortic valve is equal to the flow in the left ventricular outflow tract. And we can rearrange these terms to solve for the Doppler-derived aortic valve area with the outflow tract data up here and the time velocity integral across the aortic valve at the bottom of the equation. Here are his data. Of course, we assume the area that the left ventricular outflow tract has the um, area of a circle, which is pi r squared, or 0.785 times the diameter of the left ventricular outflow tract squared, times the time velocity integral of the left ventricular outflow tract, divided by the TVI of the aortic valve. So in his case, this yielded a Doppler-derived aortic valve area of 0.98 centimeters squared. Now remember that this top term here also gives us the stroke volume, and if we divide that by the patient's body surface area, in this case, which was 2.13 meters squared, this, this gives us a stroke volume index, which for him was 32 cc's per meter squared. 
Now, my question for you is, is this severe aortic stenosis? Almost no or yes. Valve area was 0.98 centimeters squared, peak velocity 3.7, mean gradient 35, and stroke volume index 32. And here we measured the peak velocity across the aortic valve from the right parasternal window. It was a little bit lower from right parasternal. Yes, that's what we thought too. So according to the Nishimura ACC guidelines from 2014, this would qualify as stage D, severe symptomatic aortic stenosis, in the setting of a low output. So low output, low gradient aortic stenosis. The valve area is less than one. The peak velocity is less than four, however. The mean gradient is less than 40. And the stroke volume index is less than 35 milliliters per meter squared. And this is a patient with normal ejection fraction, so low gradient, severe aortic stenosis. This patient was managed with placement of two, bio, two bioprostheses, aortic valve with a mitral flow bovine pericardial prosthesis, mitral valve replacement with a St. Jude epic porcine bioprosthesis. Patient did very well postoperatively, was promptly extubated, no complications, and on his dismissal echo, ejection fraction was 61%, and his right ventricular systolic pressure had already come down substantially by that time to 55. The gradients across his um, prostheses were all right, and he had at that time just a tiny posterior pericardial effusion. So I wanted to call to your attention the situation of the flow gradient patterns in severe aortic stenosis and the impact of the mitral regurgitation in this case. So we looked at patients with low flow, defined as stroke volume index of less than 35 cc's per meter squared, and low gradient, less than 40 millimeters mercury, in patients with severe aortic stenosis and preserved ejection fraction. And dividing them into these four groups, low flow, low gradient, low flow, high gradient, normal flow, low gradient, and normal flow, high gradient, this is what we found with the incidence of these patients. So low flow, low gradient is pretty uncommon. This is often seen in patients with lower ejection fraction, even though these were all patients with normal ejection fraction on the spectrum of normal, they tended to be lower. These patients had more atrial fibrillation and more heart failure. These patients also had reduced survival. On the other hand, the most common type was the normal flow high gradient. And these patients, of course, have a clear survival benefit from aortic valve replacement. And then the patients with normal flow, low gradient, tended to be less symptomatic, more women, people with smaller body size, and probably a lot of these patients actually have more moderate or less severe aortic stenosis, even though their valve area is less than one. There are several things that we need to keep in mind when we see this discordance between the valve area and the mean gradient. One is the possibility of measurement error. And remember that one of the things that can be measured incorrectly is this left ventricular outflow tract diameter. We need to measure that zoom, using zoomed views and very carefully. We measure it at the insertion of the leaflets. But because that measurement is squared, um, that can, if, you, if it's measured incorrectly, that will cause uh, an error. Of course, you can have a low gradient and severe stenosis if the patient has reduced ejection fraction. Remember also that there are some discordances in the guidelines classification. So actually, if you use the Gorlin formula and assume a normal cardiac output, it's a valve area of 0.8 that corresponds to a gradient of 40. For patients with small body size and left ventricular outflow tract diameter, it's probably better to index the aortic valve area and call it severe if the index valve area is less than 0.6 centimeters squared per meter squared.
And then remember the circumstances of the low output and what can cause that. I think it's important for us in the echo lab not to be hedging on, oh, it's not quite severe. If it's severe, call it severe. Now, this patient had a lot of mitral regurgitation, and of course, that is going to cause the patient to have a low stroke volume. Also, poorly controlled hypertension and constriction can be causes of low output. So in summary, multivalve disease seems to be becoming more prevalent, and it certainly can complicate our assessment and management, particularly for all the patients that come to our practice expecting to have TAVR. Um, here, mitral regurgitation and mitral valve disease, even a gradient across the mitral valve would have made that therapy uh, inadequate. The left-sided valve disease can certainly contribute to pulmonary hypertension and needs to be remembered. And then remember the causes of low gradient aortic stenosis, including significant mitral regurgitation. And I put this picture of a garden hose in because if you've got a leak in the hose, the output through the hose is gonna be less, your stroke volume is gonna be less, your gradient across the aortic valve will be less because of that mitral regurgitation. But it doesn't interfere with your calculations using the continuity equation, and the valve area will still be tight. So with that, thanks for your attention.